Good evening. I'm Steve Pope, pastor of Centerpoint Church, and we are here in Simi Valley, California, home of the Ronald Reagan Library. And uh, I'm enjoying tonight because I get to teach this class in front of the cohort that meets at our church, and that'll be a great joy for me. The topic matter is as huge as mankind and all of human history. Tonight we'll be dealing with the doctrine of mankind. I've given this a subtitle too, just so we can kind of focus in on what's going to be happening the next two nights. The subtitle is The Tragic and Wonderful Story of Mankind in Four Chapters. Each of our four sessions between tonight and next week, we broken into a chapter, and tonight we're going to be dealing with the first two, uh, dealing with the doctrine of mankind. The doctrine of mankind is sometimes called Christian anthropology. It deals with the nature of creation, the fall, and all the things that go along with that. And uh, our academic dean early on gave me an a, uh, objective for this class, along these lines, to increase our understanding of man's place in the biblical story from paradise past to paradise future via the fall and redemption. So, in other words, in the next two nights, tonight and next Tuesday, we'll be covering all of human history, human creation, all the way to human glorification in heaven with Jesus Christ. So, uh, so batten down the hatches. We're going to be moving kind of quickly. Um, I hope you all have some notes to follow along with. I sent them out and you can you can make some uh, additions to these notes as you go along. Hopefully that will be helpful to you. Uh, I, I want to share with you that what's very important to me tonight as we begin is that you understand my presuppositions. These also are the presuppositions of CB Matrix or EquipNet. So I want to share these with you as we begin so we will know what we're after here. The presuppositions, first of all, is that the Bible is without error in its original manuscripts. We believe in the full authority of the Scripture, and as such, we accept its full authority in all manners of faith and practice, including all philosophies of life, worldviews, and where the Church and Scripture conflict, we choose to believe and follow God's Word. Second presupposition is this, that uh, Genesis chapters 1 through 12 deal with actual, literal, historical events. Uh, there have been many attempts to demythologize Genesis 1 through 12. We don't accept those. We believe that the Word of God is given to us as written with the intention of God. We believe that Adam and Eve were actually real people created fully formed by God, and this universe was created by God by His spoken Word. And so we do accept that Genesis chapters 1 through 12 follow a historical, literal narrative to lay down the foundation for all of redemptive history. We also believe, most importantly, that the focal point in all biblical theology is Jesus Christ and his work of atonement. And uh, I grabbed a quote from a book, one of my favorites, by a guy named John Piper, called Let the Nations Be Glad. He says this, It is a stunning New Testament truth that since the incarnation of the Son of God, all saving faith must henceforth fix consciously on him. I also recommended this book because I think it's a good one to read. I believe this is going to be a, a classic in days to come. So this is our goal this next two nights is to deal with Christian anthropology, the doctrine of mankind, and to deal with, uh, with the implications of what the Scripture says about how we were created and what was lost at the fall and what was regained in the redemption we have through Jesus Christ. I also want to tell you that my goal tonight is not to be either overly optimistic or overly pessimistic. <clears throat> My goal is to be biblical. And um, there's good news and there's bad news in the Bible. And all of it has to be accepted to find our way to God, to begin to understand who Jesus Christ is. And uh, so here you go. First the bad news, then the good. We're going to be dealing tonight with the bad news that a person must get lost before he can be found. All of us need to grapple with this truth of Scripture, this truth, this worldview piece, that each one of us are born in sin. Uh, as Augustine said, the sin is congenital, it's from birth, and each one of us are part of the fall of mankind through Adam. We also sin in just the same way that Adam did, consciously and rebelliously. So with those cheerful words, we begin this session. Chapter 1 is the creation of mankind. This is where it all begins. Uh, I hope you're all spending time on a fairly regular basis in the book of Genesis because it's foundational for everything to come after, including the redemptive history of Jesus Christ. And so we're focusing on him in the creation of mankind. And if you look at your screen, you'll see the beginning here. Um, some of this, by the way, is going to be so basic, and you've heard it a number of times, 
but it really needs to be reviewed in this context. Some of this might be new to you. Take heavy notes and you might want to go back and review and discuss with your pastors or elders or spiritual leaders or uh, do some study on your own. But this is certainly an obvious truth. The book of Genesis is the first book in the scriptures that we've been given by God. And the word Genesis simply means origin or beginnings. Now, it's not the first chapter of the book. It's not the origin and beginning of the Bible. It's the origin and beginning of everything. Genesis presents for us the foundations of all creation in the whole universe. It's extremely essential to understand the nature of these first 12 chapters. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, it says this that in the Expositor's Bible Commentary, the account opens with a clear, concise statement about the Creator and the creation. Its simplicity belies the depth of its content. These seven words are the foundation of all that is to follow in the Bible. We read those first words, and uh, we've heard them so many times, we're maybe a little anesthetized to these words, but the Bible starts out with these words, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This is, once again, is not just the story of the creation of the elements, it's the creation of everything and the redemptive history of man on into eternity. These beginning words are the foundation for everything that is to come after in the book of Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Now, uh, this, is, this is something that I love playing with in my own mind when I read scripture. I just finished my own devotionals going through Genesis again. And the idea that this earth was created very specially with a very special intention. This earth was created to be something of a terrarium to house mankind. This earth was created as a habitat for people. God's intention in creating this universe was for us the display of his own glory. I'm going to be showing you some slides tonight from the Hubble telescope because uh, whenever I want to be reminded of the glory and awesomeness and otherliness of God, I love to look at pictures from the Hubble telescope because there are pictures and scenes that God placed millions of light years away that we'll never see with our human eye that are glorious and breathtaking. And it makes you wonder, why are they there? And the only answer is, to the glory of God. So all of this was created to the glory of God, but the part that God was so intimately interested in in the book of Genesis was in creating a habitat for you and I, a place where humanity could be born and develop a relationship with him and worship him and serve him and know him. So earth, first of all, is the habitat of mankind, and it was created by divine intervention. There's a lot of discussion about whether or not there was a Big Bang or what the mode of the creation was. What we want to lay hold of is this one truth. It's essential that we understand this, that however we see this coming about, we believe that it was created by divine intervention, that it was God's voice, God's words that called this earth and this universe into being. Um, there's a lot of discussion about this too. We hear a lot of discussion about randomness and about how a random loose matter came together and slowly but surely formed up into this universe and these planets and this earth and this humanity that we know. But it's very clear and we need to understand that all of this came about by the intention and will of God. God is the creator. Now, in, uh, in classic apologetics, through many years now, we've referred to God as the unmade maker. In other words, God made everything, but he himself was not made. God is eternal by nature. He is the only one who has lived in eternity past, present, and future. So he is the unmade maker. Uh, he's also been called by some the prime mover. He is the one who began all of this. So this universe, this earth, your body did not come about by random happenstance, by some freak chance of the collision of molecules. This came about because of the spoken word of God, the creation of a divine and benevolent and loving God, who is the one who called all this forth into order, not chaos. Remember that. Um, very important, just a few minutes. Uh, <clears throat> it begins in this, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. It says, in the beginning, God created. These are probably some of the most important words ever read, ever uttered, ever spoken. And it's a thing that we need to really grasp a hold of. It forms worldview. It shapes even our self-concept. 
that God created everything. The word created in the Hebrew is bara, means to create shape or form. Um, God had something very specific in mind when he created this world. He had something very specific in mind when he created the Garden of Eden as our first habitat. He had something very specific in mind when he created Adam and Eve's physical body and their spiritual awareness and their emotional makeup. He had something very specific in mind. He was creating and shaping and forming a creature to worship him and to know him. So in the beginning, God created bara to create, to shape, to form. This did not happen by happenstance. God didn't stand out from a distance and allow these random particles to clash and create something orderly. He stepped in and he called matter out of nothing. We're going to talk about that in another minute. We also know this, that, um, and this is something that's very important to realize. It says in that passage, and God said ten times in Genesis 1, the Hebrew word amar is used, and it means to say or to command. By the way, I put the acrostic there, T-W-O-T, the Theological Word Book of the Old Testament, another resource I want to recommend to you. Um, a little bit difficult to learn how to handle. Once you've learned how to use it, it's key to the Strong's Concordance. It's a very, very helpful tool to even the layman. Amar means to say or to command. And, and the interesting thing is, and this is extremely important for what we're going to say in another few minutes, Everything that you see was spoken into existence by the word of God's mouth. It was something that was the intention of his heart, the thoughts of his mind, brought into existence by the spoken amar, the command or word of God. That's extremely important. Everything you see around you was spoken into existence by the word of God. Um, now, I want to make some notes here. Uh, this is a, a little aside, maybe, a parenthetical statement as we move through the biblical material. Um, a reminder of what we said a minute ago. Creation did not happen randomly, and it did not flow from randomness to order. In fact, that's impossibility. That's not duplicated anywhere else in all creation. The random elements losing energy come together to form more complex Creations, more complex order. So creation did not flow from randomness to order. Creation happened when God spoke it. The second thing I want you to know is this, that the secular worldview has no explanation for the origin of matter. It doesn't matter who you're talking to, what scientists you're talking to. If they're honest, they will all admit there is no rational reason to go back as far as you can in the history past and to claim that there was some matter here already. You have to explain the origin of matter somewhere along the line. And the secular worldview has no explanation for the origin of matter, but the Bible does. In fact, the Latin phrase is ex nihilo. Ex nihilo means from nothing. God created everything from nothing. I remember when I was first saved as a teenager, uh, learning this and, and, seeing, and trying to picture nothing. What does it mean that there was nothing? And really, it will truly blow your mind. You cannot wrap your head around the concept of nothing. There was only one being, and it was the triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, who has always been. But before he spoke this into existence, there was nothing, nada, niet. No matter what language you put it in, it is ex nihilo. God created everything from nothing. He did not create from pre-existing building blocks. God didn't come upon the scene and there was rubble and he called the rubble into order. He created all of the basic elements. He created everything and started from scratch. Ex nihilo. The creation that he made was perfect according to his intention. It was what he chose, what he envisioned in his mind and his heart and he called it forth by his mouth. Now. Um, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3. Uh, we don't know who the author of Hebrews was, but the Holy Spirit spoke these words through the author. said, by faith, this is something we perceive and understand by faith. We understand that the universe was created by the word of God. Now, the word there, the Greek word is rhema, and it is a spoken word. It's an uttered word. So that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. 
God did not create this universe out of visible existing elements. He called it into existence from nothing. Okay? This is a very <clears throat> important part of the Christian worldview and how we think about life and mankind. This, by the way, is space dust near Orion's belt. We'll never see it with the naked eye. Why is it there? The answer is God's glory. Why is it there? It pleased God. So I'm just fascinated with the glory of God in this whole universe, and we're looking at one tiny part of the creation, which we're calling mankind, all right? Now, number two is this. God created everything that exists, everything. It's not that he created some things and other things just happened. It's not that he created mankind and the earth that we live in just came about by random happenstance. God created everything by the intention of his will, and the spoken word of his mouth. Now, uh, Colossians 1.16. Uh, Colossians is a beautiful, beautiful little book filled with Christology and the, and the doctrine of Christ and the beauty and power of who he is in fullness. And this is, this is a verse that's become very important to our fellowship here because we say this over and over again, that everything start to finish is all about Jesus. It's about his glory. It's about his redemptive plan. It's about his shed blood on the cross. And this is what Colossians 1.16 says. This is a New Testament lens looking back to Genesis. The New Testament places lenses looking back into the Old Testament so we can fully understand what really happened. And here's what it says. But the parentheses are mine, by the way. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions, or rulers, or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And in context, him refers to Jesus Christ. We know that the book of Colossians reveals Jesus to be the creative element of the Trinity. The intention of the Father's heart was called forth by the spoken word of the mouth of Jesus Christ, the preexistent carnate and pre-incarnate Christ, the, the Christ that existed forever and eternity with Father and Spirit. And he was the one who called all this forth by his spoken word. For by him, Jesus Christ, all things were created. Um, once again, all the way back to Genesis chapter 1, the focus is on Christ. It's on Christ Jesus and his redemptive purposes. The glory goes to God. And we look at this and we praise God that all of this came about by the spoken word of Jesus Christ. It's such a beautiful story that first he created us, and then we were lost, and then he pursued us, and then he redeemed us, and one day, by his blood, we'll be in glory with him forever and ever, because it's truly all about Jesus. Okay? So that's Colossians 1, verse 16. Second thing, <clears throat> and this is an insight that um, maybe uh, is, is, may, might be challenging to you. This might be something you've not thought about before. I think the word good in the Bible is a fascinating study. In the Hebrew or the Greek, uh, what is it that we need to know about this word good? We always need to know what the good is. We need to know what the good is that's being referred to. All creation was declared by God to be good, right? And we see that all the way through Scripture, especially the first 12 chapters of Genesis. Now, <clears throat> this is what I want you to understand. Good is the Hebrew word tob. And uh, I, I personally love this, and I hope this helps you think about the love of God in creating you and welcoming you into fellowship through the blood of Christ. The good defined in Genesis chapter 1 is that which is beneficial for man. That is the very clear technical definition of this Hebrew word. When God said it's good, <clears throat> we need to realize that God was creating the heavens and the earth as a habitat for mankind. His end game, his end goal, was to know us, was to have fellowship with us, to be worshipped by him. Uh, it's a beautiful thing to realize this creation didn't happen without God having us in mind. When he was creating the earth, he had us in mind. He had humanity in mind. He made this terrarium, this habitat, for the purpose of you and I living and existing and breathing and exerting our will and doing all the things that we do, that we would be able to live on this planet and know God and worship him. So when he says it's good, he's saying it's good 
God is saying he saw the the sun and the moon and the stars and the earth and the wind and the seasons and the rain and all of those things, and he said, this is beneficial for mankind. This is good for the people that I'm about to create. I think that really... Uh, I've, t I've said this before. I, I believe this. I, I don't need any secular books on self-esteem. I just need to read the Bible and realize how precious we are to God and how loved we are to God. We'll say more about that in a few minutes, too. Um, <clears throat> by the way, this is the Carina Nebula. This nebula is a panorama, photog panorama photograph, uh, and it's 50 light years wide. Don't even try to conceive of how wide that is. It's a crazy Crazy thing that God displayed all this glorious wonder in places that the human eye will never see, strictly for the glory of God. To remind ourselves all over and over again, the story is about the glory of God. And as he created the heavens and the earth, he did this for his glory. And then God said, let us make man. God said, well, everything's ready now. The creation is prepared. Seasons, water, rain, land, there are resources here to sustain human life. Now, let us create man. This is where the whole creation story was driving toward. And I, I think it's a, a tremendously exciting thing to realize this was God's intention from the beginning. The first, name's man, the first man's name was man. He looked and he said, that's a man. He said, his name's man. Because Adam means man. Uh, Adam simply means man. Uh, by the way, Eve means life. Adam was the man who represented all men. Eve was the one who brought life and through women through all the generations has continued to bring life. So they were the proto-male and the proto-female. They were the beginning of all humanity. They are our great 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 grandparents and to all humanity. Adam means man and Eve means life. And they were the first of the species. Now, the first creative act of the sixth day was creating Adam and Eve. The creation of Adam and Eve is unique among all other created things and the apex of creation. This is where it was all heading. The first creative act of the six days. When you're forming up a doctrine of mankind, a Christian anthropology, you need to realize that this was God's intention in creation to make a place that was habitable for men and women so that he might know them and be worshipped by them and have fellowship with them. The first creative act of the sixth day, the creation of Adam and Eve. It's unique among all those creative things. Now, I'm going to share with you why it's unique. Because, you know, God created all the animals. He created crocodiles and hippopotamuses and birds and fish. He created all the animals. But you were created in a very special way. Adam and Eve were set apart from all creation, and they were said to be very specifically the intention of God's heart. Now, see on your study guides there, what we need to realize is they are the only ones created in God's image. This is extremely important. Only man is given dominion over all the earth. Now, I, I, uh, my family has had some great pets through the years. We had a golden retriever named Honey. We loved her, and we have a cat named Ella now. We love her. We've enjoyed our pets, and we all enjoy and love our pets. Uh, we need to realize, though, that only mankind was created in the image of God. Fido and Fluffy were not created in the image of God. They were spoken into existence by God himself for his pleasure and for the pleasure of mankind. And so go ahead and enjoy your pets, but realize this. Only you were created in the image of God. Only you reflect the character of God. And that means so many things. Some we understand, some we won't understand till heaven. The ability to think, to recreate, to love, to laugh. All of the, all of the capacities of God, his image, are imprinted on us. And uh, it's a, fasc a fascinating thing that we are all created in God's image image and the Latin the imagio dei it's something that's been a, a cornerstone of Christian theology through the ages now uh, also Adam was called a type of Christ I'm sure that to most of you the term typology is familiar but it's a uh, it's a it's a very technical word referring to those things in the Old Testament that reflect something in the new um, such as, in the Old Testament, there was a physical temple, right? 
In the New Testament, there's a temple too, and the temple is our bodies. And so the Old Testament was a type of this mobile Christian unit we call human life, and the temple is even represented in heaven. These are all typologies. It says this in Romans 5.14, Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses. Now the reason the Apostle Paul says specifically from Adam to Moses is that Moses was the lawgiver, Adam fell, but even during the generations before the law, all of those who died, died in sin. And even over those whose who sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. Now, Adam and Christ, it's hard to think about how the one who brought the fall is a type of the Christ to come. But they are both covenantal heads of mankind. Adam was a covenantal head of fallen, corrupted humanity, still created in the image of God. And Jesus Christ was the covenantal head of the new birth, of redemption, and of the new man that's born in his blood. So he, Adam was a type of Christ to come. Typos is a model or a pattern. It's a prophetic symbol in the Old Testament, prefiguring a New Testament truth, a type or an anti-type, in other words, an opposite. In Adam, by physical birth, in Christ, by new birth. As we begin developing a doctrine of mankind, it begins with the, with the abject failure of Adam to maintain the holy commands of God. But Jesus Christ would see those restored later on. But this is where it begins. It begins with Adam and Eve and the fall of mankind. I, uh, I, I think it's really important, too, that we wrestle with this issue. Since God spoke everything into existence, and everything came about by the intention of God's will, and everything came about exactly as God had said, and Adam and Eve are presented in the Bible as being fully formed human beings, then we have to deal with um, the uh, imprint on our minds and our memories from our childhoods. I grew up in California school system, and even as a child, there was a, a poster that hung on our classrooms, in our elementary school classrooms, that had a picture of the time life evolutionary progression of mankind from monkey to not quite as much of a monkey to less of a monkey on to primitive man, Cro-Magnon man, and into a modern man carrying a briefcase and working on a computer. And this, this, this presentation of the stages of evolution was presented to us as fact. It was presented to us as orthodoxy and as doctrine. And so as a kid in elementary school, my teachers stood to me like almost like gods. They had great authority in my life. And there on the wall in every classroom in our school was this time life picture of the stages of mankind's evolution. Unquestioned, unexplained, but making an imprint on all of us. So our culture has accepted this worldview that, uh, that matter turned into a monkey, that monkey turned into a man, and there were lots of transitional forms. But the Word of God says that Adam and Eve did not come about by evolutionary processes. Remember I shared in our presuppositions that when culture and, uh, and Scripture clashes, that we're going to prefer Scripture, um, not by evolutionary processes, but Adam and Eve were created fully, complete. All right? Now, by the way, this is called uh, the Ring Nebula. Some uh, astrologers call it the Eye of God. Um, <clears throat> What we have to deal with here in talking about creation is macro versus micro. Some of you, uh, for some of you this is familiar, you, you thought about this. Microevolution is an observable fact. Charles Darwin went to the Galapagos Islands and he saw the finches with all different varieties of beaks adapted to different kinds of food. And we saw evolution or adaptation within species that God allows species to adapt to their environment. But the problem is, the mental leap is that there are actually micro-evolution examples happening today. And there are not. There's no proof of a macro-evolution of one species evolving into another species. As it was presented to me as a kid, pond scum that happened out of randomness became more and more orderly and grew legs and crawled upon shore and became then an amphibian and a frog and a toad and then it grew into eventually a full-grown leopard, a hippo, and a human person. 
this is the, the idea that's presented to us. But there is no proof, there's no evidence that macroevolution has ever happened. It's accepted as a fact and as orthodoxy in the culture, the Word of God does not present it to be so. And there really is no scientific evidence whatsoever of one species evolving into another species. I'm telling you the truth right now. <clears throat> if, uh, if you were taught in school, you, you were lied to. It was probably presented to you as orthodoxy and as truth, but there is no scientific foundation for what is taught. Now, and no offense to our Pope, I don't know if you noticed our newest Pope actually just made a declaration that, okay, Big Bang's good, evolution's good. We just need to hang on to this fact that we cling to the Word of God. The Word of God says that mankind, Adam and Eve, were born on planet Earth fully formed by the will, intention, and Word of God. Ape to men, thousands of fragments have now been found. Thousands of fragments have now been found. And every year that goes by, more and more fragments are being found by archaeologists, and still they fail to demonstrate a steady progression from apes to humans. <clears throat> it's never been demonstrated. Evolution is certainly not happening now, so there are no observable transitional forms. In other words, uh, those who hold to the doctrine of evolution are exhibiting a much greater faith than those who believe that God created. It is not truth. The Word of God is truth, and I'm telling you, with every ounce of authority from the Word of God, Adam and Eve were created full-blown as human beings, and we need to accept the Word of God and believe this instead of the orthodox that's being presented in our culture. Now, another thing I want you to understand, there's the macro-micro issue. That's a big issue in thinking through this, this, um, this theology of creation. <clears throat> there are those who teach evolution that have never been able to explain the second law of thermodynamics. Now, I'm way out of my depth here, but I'm going to try to explain this to you. The second law of thermodynamics says that in a closed system, there is a degeneration of energy, and because of that, all things that are orderly move to a more chaotic form. There will always be decay. There will always be degradation in forms. See, <clears throat> 11, evolution versus entropy, <clears throat> rather than the impossibility of evolution, the world is actually submitted to the second law of thermodynamics. The world is a closed system, and energy is being depleted, and decay is happening around us all the time. There is no example within a closed system of random bits and low-energy particles moving toward more and more orderly particles. Now, the, this is what I want to understand. Entropy is defined as a measure of unusable energy within a closed system. As usable energy decreases, unusable energy increases. It's a gauge for randomness and chaos within a closed system. When energy is lost, decay and chaos increases. This, this world we live in is a closed system. Chaos is increasing according to the second law of thermodynamics. And to say that evolution happened is to fly in the face of this one inviolable principle of physics. We believe that God created everything perfectly. In the garden, everything was perfect. And since sin entered the world, decay has begun. And rather than moving from less order to more order, the creation is moving toward more chaos. So, those who teach evolution can't explain macro versus micro. They can't explain the lack of transitional forms. They can't explain why, out of all other examples in the universe, this one is different, that entropy is just not happening. It did not happen with mankind, that there was an increasing order in the, in the, in the progression of mankind's evolution. Now, um, <clears throat> I put this here as a summation of this to you. <clears throat> in denial of all observable data, Evolutionists hold out hope that mankind will perfect itself and society through effort and education. Whereas the biblical worldview informs us that mankind is totally depraved, self-destructive, and in need of a savior. There's a whole different set of assumptions about mankind in our nation. There are those who assume that mankind is basically good, that all people are born basically good, and if the environment is right and the education is effective, 
that they will increase and become better and better and better, eventually perfecting society, even themselves. That is not our presupposition. Our presupposition is this, that mankind needs a savior, that we are born totally depraved. We were born dead in sin. We tend to be selfish. We tend to be wicked. And left to our own devices, we will self-destruct. The Word of God is very clear that this is the place we begin in the doctrine of mankind, that Adam and Eve fell, the fall of mankind affected every human being since then, and not only are we affected by Adam's fall, but we all sin in the same way that he did. Okay, I put some resources there on your study guides, your little note sheets there. Uh, you, you can start anywhere. There are hundreds and hundreds of resources on the Internet. Uh, three of them I found helpful on the Internet. The uh, ICR.org, Institute of Creation Research, has some tremendous information. Uh, AllAboutScience.org, AnswersInGenesis.org. Um, and a good primer, if you want to begin reading a book, if you actually still read books, uh, there's a book called Darwin on Trial by Dr. Philip Johnson. He was a Berkeley prof. And he wrote about the scientific lack of evidence to support Darwinian evolution. So I'm just, I'm just letting you know, uh, as you form up your doctrine of mankind, if you accept the doctrine of evolution, that you've basically flown in the face of the context of the Bible that says that everything was created perfect, everything was created good, and there has been a decay since then because of the sin of mankind. Therefore, we know that what we really need is not to perfect ourselves. What we need is a Savior. Okay? Oh, man. Once you see this, <clears throat> you talk about evolution, and I think that each one of us has held our children and our grandchildren in arms. This is my granddaughter and my wife, and, and uh, I remember just the marvel, the miracle of holding my own children and <clears throat> looking at their incredible fingers and toes, and just the beauty of their creation and watching them grow. This was from last year. My granddaughter, Kaya, is now almost 18 months, and uh, we just love her. We're crazy about her, just like you are, crazy about your own kids and grandkids. The one thing that um, I think that I say that sometimes unsettles people is that um, babies are born in sin. And, you know, she's, uh, she's kind of a toddler now, and if you want to observe the sin nature at work, <laughs> have you ever had to try to change the diaper on a toddler? Or tell a toddler, no, we love the little Kaya, but she's in love with the garbage can. And she heads to the garbage can every time you turn her back, and she digs in there and looks for stuff, and we tell her no and pull her away. But frankly, she's got her own little will, and she's a great kid. You know, she's, she's nigh unto perfect and gifted, of course. But what I know is that as precious as she is to us, as precious as she is to God, she was born with a sin nature. We are all born with a sin nature. We are all card-carrying sinners. That is the worldview presented by Scripture. And if you don't get a hold of that, you'll never find the place there where you're teaching a Savior that can really redeem mankind from sin. Now, the word image is the Hebrew salem. And the amazing thing is holding little babies, uh, holding little babies, precious little babies, and looking at them and, and realizing they, too, were created, imprinted by the image of God. The fingerprint of God is on every baby born into this world. It's an amazing thing. And uh, the question the psalmist asked is the question that has still rung through the ages in Psalm chapter 8, verse 4. The psalmist said simply, what is man? I think that we're still asking that question, all of us, and we're coming up with different answers. We want to turn to the Bible and say, what is man? We know so far that man was created by God. He was created according to the perfect intention of God. He was created in the image of God. We know these things from the Word of God. We also know that mankind fell, sinned, and rebelled, and since then humanity has lived in rebellion. So what is man? But the hopeful thing is this. The psalmist goes on to give this, this beautiful explanation of humanity, and the psalmist says, Remember, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. That's all of us. We don't need to struggle with self-esteem. We just need to accept the fact that we were created in the image of God. We just need to accept who we are and accept who God is to have order in our minds and our lives because the psalmist's question, what is man, is answered in this way. You are the creation of God, created in the image of God, and you were fearfully and wonderfully made. 
and God did not make a mistake when he created you exactly as you are. Now, we also know this from Genesis 1, 26 and 27. We were made in his image, which is unique in the created order. There is no other creation. There is no other part of creation. God didn't create the moon and say the moon is in my image. He didn't create animals and say some of them are in my image. He said mankind is created in my image. We are unique in all of the created order. And I want you to know this. Even after the fall, the image remains <clears throat> marred but not erased. The image of God still resides in every man and woman and child on this earth. The image of God has been damaged by sin but not destroyed. It's been marred but not erased. One of the discussion questions I have for you during the break time is dealing with the fact that when we look at lost people that we ought to realize that in them when they create or do something <laughs> glorious or beautiful or do something noble or heroic that what we're seeing in them is not salvation or not obedience to God but we're seeing the image of God although it's been damaged and marred the image of God still rests in the people that God created yeah, have you ever seen a uh, a painting done by a person who did not know Jesus Christ and he looked at it and saw the wonder and awe of the glory of God in those things because they were creating out of the image of God in them not out of a redeemed soul. Each one of us were created in the image of God, and the image of God still remains marred, tainted, damaged, but not destroyed and not erased. This is part of essential doctrine, dealing with the doctrine of mankind. When we look at people, we need to realize they were all created in the image of God. Okay? Now, I even uh, I think it's interesting, going back to Genesis 9, verse 6, that in a world full of violent men, where people seek to destroy the image of God and other people, one thing that gives human beings value is that they're all created in the image of God. And God himself says, <clears throat> whoever sheds the blood of a man, by man shall his blood be shed. A first legal code enforced, uh, an expectation of some kind of righteousness exerted when there's violence. But the reason given by God is so interesting because Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. The rationale God gives is, the value is, the image of God. God made them in his own image. I think it's a, an astounding thing. It should also, even today, inform our thoughts about the sanctity and the value and sacredness of human life in relationship to God's creation. Now, uh, this is the this is the beautiful thing, and this is maybe jumping ahead of the doctrine of mankind into more Christology, but this is what I want you to understand, that when you gave your life to Jesus Christ, when you turned your back on the world and repented and, and chose Jesus Christ as your Lord to follow, no matter what the cost, God began a process in you. God began a process of restoring the likeness of Christ in you. And uh, we have many people seeking to know the will of God and if I can be so bold I want to tell all of you who are listening the will of God for you can I do that the will of God for you is that you be conformed to the image of Christ Jesus that the character of Christ come forth in you uh, the Genesis the Galatians 5 22 the the fruit of the Spirit the character of Christ coming forth in you more and more each day that when you gave your life to Christ there was almost a reversal of the fall that God began to reshape you, reform you, and, and to restore the image of Christ until the day of Christ Jesus. We're not going to make it perfectly formed to heaven, but we're going to be different than we were at the beginning. Because when you were saved, God began a process of restoring the likeness of Christ in us. In 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18, it says this, And we all, with unveiled face, referring to Moses and the way he kept the veil on, after the glory had long since departed, we all with unveiled face beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. When you became a Christian, when you were born again and you were made to be a new creation, the Holy Spirit came on board and the process of transformation began and God has been working on you since day one to call forth the image of Christ that more and more each day that you might manifest the love and gentleness and kindness and patience and peace and joy of Jesus in your life. 
It is God restoring what was lost at the fall, even on this fallen planet. Now, <clears throat> this is the other part of the creation of mankind, the doctrine of mankind that makes it special. The one, the first principle is this: that uh, that you were called into existence and spoken forth by the by the spoken word of God. Then, from the dust of the ground, you were formed and shaped by God into what He desired, into His image. And then the next thing that happened that set humanity apart from all the rest of creation is that mankind, Adam and Eve, were breathed into existence. A living spirit was breathed into them. The capacity for spiritual life was breathed into them. That we might know God, we might worship Him and have a relationship with Him. That breath of God is unique among humanity. And once again, as much as we love our pets, uh, Fluffy and Fido were not breathed with the breath of God. They were spoken into existence by a benevolent, kind, and loving God. People are unique in this planet. The redemptive efforts of God are toward the hearts of men and women. Now, Genesis chapter 2, verse 7 says this, that we were formed from the dust of the ground. And uh, there's an interesting wordplay in the Hebrew. Adam means man, Adam, and Adama, which is a, a very similar word, means ground or dirt. And it says that mankind was created from the dust of the ground. And, you know, in, in olden days in the funerals, we used to say, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. This is why, because we were formed from the dust of the ground. And then when we were formed and created that Hebrew word bara, then God breathed life into us, that spiritual capacity into us. And this is the nature of mankind. And also, in the Hebrew, the word yatsar, means formed. It's a word picture. And the word picture, if we had been ancient Hebrews that would have come to mind, is of a potter forming clay into the shape of a man. Uh, like statuary that God formed and shaped from the dust of the earth, this clay, into this figure of man. He shaped him in the image of God with the capacities to know God, to laugh, to love, to, to give, to share, and then created with the breath of God the very life of God available, a spiritual life. It says, God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. God breathes life, physical, mental, spiritual, into the one created to bear his image. The rest of creation was spoken into existence. I don't want to belabor this point, but this is so important in the understanding this doctrine that men and women are unique. We're in the image of God, we're spoken into existence like all of the rest of creation, but then we're shaped and formed by the hand of God, and then by the breath of God, the ruach of God, we have life breathed into us. Um, I actually was locate, able to locate uh, a picture of the Garden of Eden, and um, just kind of had to scoot around the chair a little bit, but uh, this, is, this is the closest picture I could find to something beautiful and perfect and glorious, so... You can have to deal with this in your own mind. What was the Garden of Eden like? What was it about even? The garden was mankind's first home. It was our first home. It was the first piece of real estate created and dedicated for mankind. And, and it's an amazing piece of real estate. We're going to talk about this and look at this. In Genesis 2, verse 8, it says, And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put... You can circle that word put because it's a bigger word than you think it is. The Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Formed, shaped, image of God, breathed, all creation. This garden is the terrarium for the habitation for mankind, perfect, meeting every need they have, and allowing the freedom for relationship with God. An amazing place. In Eden <clears throat> is the word translated delight or pleasure. Um, the Septuagint, which was the early Greek translation of the Jewish scriptures, um, translated this as the Garden of Delight or Paradise. It was a perfect, flawless, wonderful, breathtaking, beautiful place. It says God planted the garden as a home for Adam and Eve. Listen to this. The garden was perfect. Creation is no longer perfect. It's tainted and marred by the sin of mankind. But the garden was created, planted and created perfectly as a home for Adam and Eve. <clears throat> that word put that we circled a minute ago, to put is a Hebrew word specifically referring to 
uh, a place where man can rest and be safe, a place of safety, a place of rest. He didn't need to fear predators or poisonous, venomous serpents. He had no fear. There was safety. There was rest. It was a place where God put him for fellowship with him. Genesis chapter 3, verse 8. The garden was something of a holy temple where Adam and Eve were able to meet with God every day if they desired to. An amazing thing. And um, now, as we come to the end of this section, with one minute to spare, uh, we're going to move now into our discussion section. And we've bitten off a lot. And uh, I want you to take your discussion questions and, and turn to facilitators and enter into a, a period of discussion. Feel free to ask any questions. And uh, this session might have raised some new questions for you. You might want to dive in and uh, do some more research. Discuss this among yourselves for the next few minutes. And we'll see you in 30 minutes, 40 minutes, 40 minutes. Thank you.